Hello my friends, I'm Lucas and you're watching Coldemons PL. If you like my work, please remember to click thumb up, subscribe to my channel and write some comments. First of all, I would like to mention my wonderful patrons who support my activity. Massive thanks guys! The people who help me the most are Bulldog09, Christopher Obarski, Dan Dubois and Dan Mikeshak. But the people listed just now are also my great patrons. They all believed in my passion, saw something valuable in it and decided to support me. It's really great when you know that there are a few crazy guys in the world who think like you, want to watch what you build and appreciate the effects of your work. This is really super motivating and gives me the strength to continue working. Please don't forget that you can be one of them. That's why in each episode I encourage you to support me in my passion. And I realize it's not easy these days, but if you have a few bucks you could drop in my cup, that would be great. Thanks! This is re-edited and compressed story of my Tiger One early from Border Model I published in the beginning of Coldemon's PL channel. Now as one long episode it's loaded with useful tips and tricks. If you are looking for inspiration, you've just found it. In a few minutes you will know what to do to make your model look great. Ok, these pins are designed to stabilize the chassis, but I decided to make it partially movable because it would be easier to adjust the model to the base. The first and the last pins stay in the place for better stabilization. I glued the end inside with super glue and that's how it works when the whole section is ready. And a little trick for the transparent visors. It's enough to stick the masking tape and remove it after painting in order to not worry about the good appearance of the glass. I was very curious to see how the grill nets fit. We can use them although their accuracy is highly debatable. I don't mean the overall size because this one is well suited to the model but the shape and appearance of the meshes. Their weave isn't as it should be, which is easy to see in archival photos. I cut them out of the photo etched plate and sanded the edges and then with the help of the bending tool I prepared them for adding to the kit. No spectacular success, but it's good. Black Widow Super Glue from AK is the best option at this point, because it gives the possibility of exact positioning of the parts and dries after a while. Oh, please forgive me for not framing the shot. And we put in the right place. A moment of pressing and it's ready. Now a little kneading with the tip of the tweezers and we can move on the next parts. In the end they look good on the model and their incompatibility with the original is not so visible when we glue them. In the beginning I was quite happy with the weld bits in the model, but then I decided to replace them and made some new by myself. The most important thing now was to cut the old welds quite accurately. The best tool for this is a special scriber, I also use the modeling knife to cut out all the remains. Generally you have to be very careful because it's easy to go beyond the line and damage the surface of the model. And now quite a big oversight done by the producer. The front plate is clearly too thin and you need to thicken it. It's not a complicated task but requires some precision. It's enough to stick a strip of plastic of the appropriate thickness and we have a thick plate. But we also have to weld it on. So I made an additional groove for green stuff using the same method as before. You have to do it really delicately so as not to unnecessarily damage the elements around. As long as there are no glued details and no weld bits, we can improve the texture of the steel. Of course it's not necessary and if someone says that what is prepared by the manufacturer suits his needs, okay. As for me it's worth spending time doing something nicer. I used AK putty for this and diluted it with water. The old brush was best for applying this mix. While it was drying I tapped the surface a bit and added a bit more putty here and there. After drying and it was quite fast, I sanded all the surfaces and the armor plates were ready. It's important to be moderate in this case because if you add too much putty, the effect will be not convincing and similar to the Soviet armor casting. I rolled out the green putty into thin sausages or snakes, 
uh, it doesn't matter how we can call this thing. To arrange them in the grooves I prepared earlier. I added a little water to prevent the mask from sticking to the tools. And now, bit by bit, I fill in all the places on the hole where it had to be done. To shape the mass I used my old C-shaped tool which is made up of a piece of thin metal plate, a toothpick and a metal handle. Previously this piece of metal plate was heated over the flame so that it could be bent more easily depending on the size of the wheels we need. I wonder how many times I have imprinted the weld beams on this model. I have to try to count them next time. During the construction I relied on these two books which contain almost all the knowledge that modelers need to create a miniature of a tiger. They are not the latest in fact, but it's not a problem. Historical knowledge is not getting old. If you have the opportunity to buy one or both, I highly recommend them because they will definitely be useful when working on Tiger 1 or King Tiger. Ok, now it's time to make some detailing on the model. We start with the back wall with all the elements that need to be there. First, the biggest elements which mean exhaust and air filters from the FIFO system. After basic gluing some texture has to be applied to the exhaust covers and exhaust pipes. It wasn't complicated because I used the same putty again. Quick drying with the hair dryer and sanding of course. Half of them will be obscured anyway, but leaving them without the texture isn't an option. The exhaust have open flaps because I have a plan to put the model on a stand in a combat position, with the engine running. Originally I wanted to use the upper shields. I took one out to check. After warming it up properly with the torch flame it became much softer and was easy to bend. I was afraid that it might not fit the handles on the model and sadly it was true. The cover itself looks great, but the size differences are too big and my laziness took over so I left the mufflers without covers, which is also correct as I found in the war pictures. All in all, when I make German vehicles I always add photo etch set to build the jack from scratch, but the number of these parts discourages me from working on them. Maybe I will make some separate video for some freaks if they are so eager to see how it looks like. It's just an idea, let me know what do you think about this. Here I only replaced the handles and the crank. I attached the printed 3D clamp, but the jack is not fully attached. So what do we have here? This metal tube or more precisely the tip that I am about to cut will be the ring for the spare antenna tube. The plastic profile looks much better than the part from the model, so I decided to make it from scratch. It wasn't that hard anyway, now you can see exactly how both parts look like. I guess I did it better. Here the same way of masking the periscope glass as we used in the beginning. A simple work, but we need a sharp knife to cut the masking tape even. And you have to stick it well so that the paint doesn't flow underneath. I hope to remember to check it out before painting. The weld bits look really nice, so I left them. I'm just cutting off the 3D printed clamps. I said it before on the E60 movie. Despite the price, I definitely prefer it than photo etched. Faster and more accurate. I don't need movable ones, they just need to be accurate and hold the tools well, but there I only use them on the rear of the vehicle where they were missing. The tools are good enough that there is no point in changing them and doing it just to say that there is a super duper clumps everywhere. It's simply pointless for me. Time is money. And right after that I glued all the tools back to their place. Easy. Easy. 
now it's a good moment for some jewelry accessories. First the bar of the front machine gun, which is a super accurate replica from the master model. It consists of two parts and we need to glue it before adding to the kit. If you want to buy some, just check the link in the description. Then I prepared cleaning rods with handles to which towing cables were also attached. I used an upper kit for this even though I also had 3D prints, but I wanted to use this kit so that it wouldn't be smacking around the box with accessories. The center must be filled and properly formed. Fortunately simple tools like a toothpick will make this job easier. To find the place where all the handles should be glued I used the drawings from the book that I showed earlier and made out the appropriate places. It could be done more easily by measuring the distance but sometimes the simplest ideas come too late. Nevertheless the handles had their location and I was able to safely add them to the model. Now I could take care of the towing cables. Those of you who saw my models in previous videos and various articles know that I mainly use Eureka XXL products. For me this is the best solution and I haven't come across a model yet in which these cables are better than their products. Resin ends require gentle cleaning and are practically ready for further use just after this. On this model to find the right length of each rope I used plastic parts and adjusted the length by adding a little bit at both ends to slide into the resin ends. Well now how to put the tip in a shackle, just gently cut the eyelet in the right place, stretch it, but gently, gently and click, sits in the right place. Now the rope is attached to the model and it's ready. Of course earlier I had planned and properly bent the entire section so as not to struggle when it was already clipped into the handles, all was saved with drop of super glue. And this is how the whole arrangement of the ropes on the model looks like. I did the same with a thin rope to hold the trucks during repair or servicing. Here I went a little crazy and created the final layout with some artistic freedom. I prepared the wheels and glued them together into complete sets. When applying you have to think a little bit but the movable rods give a lot of opportunities to put the individual wheels freely. A little bit of strength and everything is going well. I wouldn't be myself if I didn't add some upgrades. I accidentally hit an ET model set with resin wheels without rubber bands. I risked buying them even though they are not intended for border but for dragon. And there is actually a small difference in size but not so visible that you can give up using this set. I trimmed a little and tweaked the mounting so that all the wheels were in line and ready. Before the final placement I will establish their position in row once again because for now they are being put in place only for checking. The drive and idle wheels fall into place without any major problems. Only a bit of blue tack for a hold was needed as there is no rubber inside like on other brands models. And now you can clearly see how all axes work. I hope they will fit nicely to the base. Well, I hope? No, I'm sure that it will be so. The moving wheels never want to jump right into their place and they need a little help. 
especially in Tiger where we have a total of 48 road wheels and each has to find its place on the tracks. Well, when everything is fine it looks really cool. I shortened the tracks a bit and added the leftovers to my spare parts box. In this way I have already completed half of the second set of metal tracks. In the future I will use them on some wreck or uh, end war mix version 1. We'll see. Now we can easily install the fenders. They are also from the Jewelry category and undoubtedly enrich the model. However I had it, this is the one with exhaust covers and decided to make use of it. I formed the fenders on a bending tool and before the gluing I gently destroyed the straight lines on the edges and then once they were in place I hit them with a sharp skewer to make battle marks. It's important to arrange them in a random manner. To make a strong connection I glued small pieces of the plastic profile on the underside which will be invisible anyway because I'm going to cover them with mud. There are also small grenade launchers on the Abers photo edge set. I didn't like the ones that I put on earlier and they had a bad shape because were intended to be used on turrets launchers. So first I heated the plate with a torch. Then, gradually making the appropriate shape, I prepared all the launchers for adding to the kit. I could also use metal bases, but I didn't want to tear off the plastic parts anymore, because it would be more work to repair than it was worth. And that's how it ends when we work too hard with the model. Fortunately, it was quickly repaired. Now the coolest part for me is screwing the metal muzzle brake. Some kind of fetish or what? I never thought something like this would be so fun. The second set with bars for my Tiger is also from Master Model, but this time it's only one part to be mounted in the turret. Great stuff! Before I put all the elements of the turret together, I first need to make new welding. Exactly the same as before on the hull, but now I will use the fact that it's not glued yet. You have to be careful and calmly take out an excess of plastic. A sharp knife is an essential tool at this point, but I admit that it's easy to cut yourself. I did it. But then you can say that the model was born in blood and pain. After gluing the whole thing I also cut out the side welds. Almost all of them, but I decided to leave those around side visors and commander start. Laziness has won. All the edges have been gently sanded and softened with a thin plastic glue. And now I could start applying new welding. Same as before. All in all it's getting pretty quick. The white of the metal barrel made the whole thing swing, so I decided to add the white on the opposite end. Two nuts did the trick. A few drops of super glue and we have stabilization ready. Last but not least, some cool effects with traces on the turret armor. The rolled armor plate isn't perfect and when we add battle marks to it, the surface shouldn't be smooth. Small holes, bigger holes, dents, scratches, all this can be prepared in a few minutes. Then sand it lightly and cover with thin glue. As for me the effect is nice and it will be fun to paint it and do some extra weathering.
first you have to disassemble the whole thing into basic elements so that's easier to paint them. In total in this model the most work will be done with the wheels because the rest is glued to the model permanently. Do you know why German designers came up with such a complex chassis? Well, whoever watched the previous episodes knows. <laughs> if someone asked why I pressed two sticks into the wheels, the answer is simple. I didn't have thicker sticks, so I pressed the toothpick. No matter what was the way I choose, it's important to make it comfortable while painting. To paint a metal antenna, I follow a very simple idea. I prepared a bamboo stick and drill a hole in it for the end of the metal rod. When it sits deep enough, there is no option for it to fall out while painting. One more thing to do and unfortunately I was unable to apply my fancy tool to hold the model. I will use a round file as a handle, I know it's brutal and not very elegant, but at the moment I didn't have anything better at hand. It's important that the model holds and that all places can be easy reached. I found a more effective way to prepare the model for painting. Instead of washing it in water with liquid and wasting time drying and drawing water from all nooks and crannies, just use the model degreaser. It's a special product designed to remove any dirt from the surface that is there after the construction process. Apply the liquid with the soft brush and wait for it to dry. As you can see it's a very quick process. It's important not to touch the washed surface with bare fingers. Sometimes the plastic can become dull but this is the normal result of using this product. It can be used on resin and on photo etched parts and don't forget to work in a well ventilated room or even outdoors. And this is my next super duper tool, the second life of an old cardboard box. The model is clean now so we can start serious fun with applying the foundation. I use primer R on all metal parts, I always apply it with a brush. It's worth paying attention to the engine grill covers so that you don't accidentally clog individual mesh eye with the liquid. Later it will look ugly and even cleaning them with a pin or other sharp tool won't turn to a perfect look. The model prepared in this way can be easily covered with a suitable primer for painting. Here I use a light grey primer which was applied straight from the can. Start the compressor, attach the airbrush and let's go and paint something. First the reddish brown color of the factory primer. My favorite mix of the XF9 and XF7 is perfect for this task. I put it only on the places where it won't be camo colored. So on the bottom of the hull, on the sides and wheels on the inside. Oh, red color and red button below. Subscribe now and be one of the chosen. Then I prepared a dark yellow for the basic camo color. By the way, this is a new series of Tamiya paints and I have to say that I like this color very much. It fits perfectly in my opinion. I diluted this paint with Acrylic Doctor which is a very good thinner for all acrylic paints. In the bottle we have a pipette that can precisely measure the amount of thinner and also easily apply it to the airbrush. And now we are going with painting. We have to cover everything and even if it covers the earlier layer of Minya a little it doesn't matter. In my opinion such imperfections look more interesting and are more natural than perfectly placed color lines. When the whole thing was ready I put the airbrush aside for a moment and started painting the wheels and more specifically the rubber rims. Unfortunately I didn't have a quick wheel mask for this model so I had to paint each wheel by hand. 
As you know, there is a quite huge amount of them because the designers want to make the modeler's life easier. But the basis is a good brush, well diluted paint and a steady hand because it's easy to go beyond the color border. But even if it does, it won't be a tragedy. Everything can be tweaked or covered with mud at the later stage. I have already painted all the wheels so I can go back to camo painting. Now it's time for green paint which is also the new paint from Tamiya. The green one isn't juicy and I see a bit of grey in its shade but it goes well with the base color. I hope the brown in this series is also so cool and will go well with the three tonal camo. I was wondering in what form this camo should be presented because in the archival photos of this vehicle you can see exactly how it looked like. I was based on the available photos of other vehicles but they are not exactly a clue either. On some of them it was also supposedly dark grey so what I did here is my version which doesn't necessarily agree with reality, but it looks pretty good and quite typical for a German vehicle from that period. Of course it's very important to dilute the paint well so that you can safely paint without masking the base color. Only at the fender's level I stuck a piece of masking tape to cut off the colors evenly, as if the camo was painted with a set of fenders when the vehicle wasn't yet a battle-worn veteran. I'm cautious about colorful painting schemes presented in the manual and other materials that I found on the internet. Pictures of this particular vehicle don't show the proper camo layout, so my version is rather based on an analysis of the available pictures and common sense. I guess it looks pretty ok. The top surfaces are also guesswork, but in general I assume that the crew didn't play with it too much, so any shortcomings are acceptable and even advisable. In my opinion they raise the realism of the model. And talking about realism, recently I saw a perfect example of how a painting similar to one made in the field should look like. This is the Panzer IV model by my colleague Łukasz Kapelski. The finish of his painting is far from the ideal presented on most models where the colors are perfectly painted. In my opinion this is how a realistic model of a vehicle prepared by the crew which is under time pressure in a field workshop should look like. Check it out. Note all the imperfections that build up the overall look. For many modelers this may be difficult to accept but it's a matter of taste and I like it a lot. I was wondering which color to choose but I used NATO black as the basic color for the exhausts. For now I'm staying here because I'm preparing a separate film for the how to paint series to show the whole painting process on the exhausts from the beginning to the end with all the extra effects, damaged paint and rust. I will be testing new weathering paints from Modeler's World. So don't forget to check what you can do with them. We go back to the wheels again, but now I will mainly deal with the drive and idler wheels. Due to the fact that they were the most polished by the working trucks, I painted all the places where the guide teeth came into contact with them silver. And in the drive wheels all the teeth that entered the holes in the trucks were also painted with this paint. It's important not to color them too deeply, that is not to paint an element that couldn't be polished to bare steel in real life. In some photos from the war I saw this little element above the sighting devices. It was a roof that was supposed to protect against raindrops and sunlight. I don't know how effective this simple solution was, but I decided that it might look nice on my model. I made it as a welded piece of metal so there will be some rust and welding marks for sure. Now on a dark brown as the base color was painted. The same as the interior of the smoke grenade launchers. I also painted the base color of the machine gun barrels. Then I started painting the tools. I covered all the steel elements with a mixture of black and silver. 
Later I will modify this color a bit during weathering, so now I won't dwell on it too much. I have browned the wooden parts of the cleaning rods. I wanted them to stand out from the remaining wooden handles of tools such as a shovel or a hammer. For me the most important thing is diversity. You can of course play in painting the rings, but somehow I was never convinced of this effect. Maybe at the later stage I will do something with this, but for now they will stay uh, in brown. I hope not to forget. It's very important in the case of tools and other equipment details already glued to the model to be especially careful when painting. You need to get a good brush and pay special attention to painting at the edges so as not to cover the camo colors. It's better to do it slowly and accurately than to do some extra work and improve the painting done with the airbrush which will be always difficult and inconvenient. You can use a piece of paper to cover specific surfaces. The same methods must be used to paint the towing cables. I follow the rule that in a given position of the model I paint as much as possible from visible and accessible places. Then I rotate the model and do the same but now looking from a different angle. In this way the efficiency and speed of painting increases and we don't have to rotate the model all the time. Try it! Satisfaction guaranteed! The standard German grey was used to paint the fire extinguisher. I made such a contrast on purpose, especially since it will have an extra sticker from Archer on it. Such a little trifle makes you happy. I played with the silver paint again and painted the screw heads. Generally thought by experience I don't limit myself to it because I know that later, after the weathering, many of these small points will disappear or be much less visible. And the ones that will stay will contrast nicely with the rest of the model's surface. Well, in this way we got to the end of the main painting. All elements are in the correct color. Now I start applying the markings. The first thing was to spray a few thin layers of glossy varnish from the airbrush. A good base for decals is very important, and due to the fact that I hadn't worked with the stickers from this company before, I preferred not to risk it. I trimmed the edges of the crosses with a sharp knife. As it turned out later, it wasn't necessary because the decals were very thin. They quickly detached from the transfer paper and I could put them on. And truly speaking, it was a pleasure to work with this product. As all of the stickers have already been placed, I used microscale sole to soften the foil and press into the surface. It turned out almost perfect. Ok, here you go. Ready for the next stage. I think the job went quite smoothly and the effect is nice. I hope the weathering will diversify this model even more and it will be another gem in some collection. Previously the model was covered with glossy warnings so the application will go quickly because the paint will flow over the surface as we expect. It's much easier than washing on the matte surface. There is simply more work which at the same time equals more time spent on this stage. Not everyone likes it, so my proposal is a shiny foundation and the work will be smooth and fast. Generally I don't like to work on a model with cotton buds when cleaning the wash, especially on surfaces with a lot of details, but on smooth ones such as the road wheels, 
There isn't a problem. The most important thing is that the wash should be dry but not dry completely and besides the smooth surface makes it easier to clean it. The rule is simple, the more precisely we apply the product, the less work it will be needed to wash off the excess and inaccuracies. Such a life wisdom over the thinner bottle. In some places it's worth applying a second wash layer to enhance the effect. I did it on the weld lines so that all the depressions were clearly visible. Although it may be a bad word and it would be better to say emphasized. I guess so. That will be better. Yep. Yep, yep, yep. When I painted the drive wheels I made a mistake that needs to be fixed. I painted the teeth silver on the outside unnecessarily. As you can see trucks wouldn't wrap them, so a stupid mistake but luckily it took a couple minutes to fix it. Do you like paint chips and scratches? I like it, but only when it doesn't last all day. Everything within reason and so that the model looks natural. I always wonder when to finish so as not to overdo it. After all the vehicles at the front didn't have a long life and it was rather counted in weeks. Of course there were also accidents that their lives lasted much longer, but let's be realistic. I am talking about it because the amount of chips is proportional to the age of the vehicle. It sounds funny but I am explaining what I mean. It's enough to answer the question. How much in the front conditions could the paint coating be damaged if the vehicle was used for 3 weeks? Well, to be honest we can only assume because none of us was a soldier during World War II and those vehicles that are currently serving and participating in conflicts are not as exploited as those from the great conflicts so they can't be references. Am I right? If there is any soldier who can confirm or deny it let me know in the comments. The second thing is that we are building a model and the exact copying of a real vehicle won't end well for the final appearance of our replica. But maybe more on that another time. So the amount of chips shouldn't be large in my opinion. My rule is that every few moments I move away from the model to look at it from a distance and see if I already have enough scratches or if I can go crazy with the brush even more. Common sense is the key to success. Ok, what is my way for painting the scratches on the model? It's very simple. I use the base paint which is exactly the same sand Tamiya color which I painted the first camo color. Why? After covering the model with glossy varnish its coating darkened. Additionally I made the wash and we have the answer. Now you can see how much the base color has darkened and why I use this paint. The contrast is good enough. I painted all the chips with a sponge and brush. I worked on individual elements so I didn't leave any place and scratches appeared wherever I planned. All light spots were then filled with dark brown base paint. Of course the method was the same and it actually took faster than painting the first chips because I didn't have to wonder where to put them. Some places needed special attention. For example I treated the elements of the air filter system with special care because in my opinion this place was exposed to quite strong damage due to short boots of soldiers. The same defenders or the edge of the commander's turret. The wheels were also painted accordingly. I don't always do this but here the flat and large surfaces required a little touch of love. In particular damaged wheels without rubber bandages where it was inconceivable to leave them without scratches and at the later stage without rust. Now a bit of rust which will always come in handy on models of armored weapons. On a piece of cardboard I squeezed a little light and dark rust. All this to drain excess of oil. In fact in the case of my paints I don't have to do it because they are so old that the oil leaked out. So the cardboard is almost dry. Well never mind. 
I apply tiny amounts of paint where I painted the scratches and leave it for a while. Then blend gently with a brush moistened with a thinner. Well, we start another walk around all the elements of the vehicle. Generally it shouldn't take much time compared to the first stage of painting the chips, but you need to prepare a good drink and start your favorite CD to make the work run smoothly. Pure relaxation. You know, still must be rusty. And even the ultra-modern Abrams have some on them. I saw it with my own eyes. As soon as the rust is in place, we can take care of making dirt using grey and black. This is a simple task. We apply the paint wherever we want to emphasize this effect, modify the core or simply common sense tells us that there should be some stains, dirt or a fake shadow. I use this method near hatches in depressions at the edges where the crew could soil the surface. In addition you can also apply this paint in any other way if the effect we get will meet our needs. It's worth a try. When everything is done we can keep the effect of our work by applying a matte varnish. I used modeler's world. Yeah, again. You don't need to dilute it and the effect is great after drying. Well, it was fast work, so now we can go to the next stages. I applied a few thin layers of sand-colored weathering paint to the entire chassis. Let me tell you that these droppers are a great solution. Convenient and you can accurately dose the amount of paint and even pull out of the airbrush if something is left. The producer had a great idea to use them. Of course this effect couldn't be missing on all wheels where I also applied the appropriate layer. After drying with the dryer you can easily proceed to the next work. As soon as I had the wheels on the table I decided to put some mud on them and more specifically on the inner side. As you can see I generally didn't save the product, the more so that I had in mind all the time that at 99% no one would look under the model to check how dirty the wheels are. I was more concerned with getting a natural look on the idler and drive wheels. That's why I stuffed quite a lot of mud into the crevices where it undoubtedly collects during off-road riding. As I did it, all the dirt on the edges polished by trucks was wiped off with the cotton bat. From the outside I also added a bit of mud to finish the wheels clogging. I think the effect is very good, I like it a lot and I'm sure it will be nicely connected with the ground of the base. So now we can prepare the lower part by applying pigments and mud on it. First a little glue to stick the pigments. I wasn't limiting myself too much here, I just spread the powder at random using two colors. 
I tried to build an uneven structure to diversify the look of the entire piece of this section. I let it dry and began to apply powder to the underside of the hull. The main point was to color it as dried mud and make the base for applying the fresh mud. Just like on the piece that you can already see. Here I used both colors the same. I pressed them to the surface by rolling with a cotton bud. Then I soak them on the entire surface with white spirit. To speed up the drying I use a hair dryer of course. You can safely do it because all the powder sticks to the surface and won't be blown away. Note that the spare tracks are already attached to the model to immediately unify them while applying the mud, which was started just after drying. I was pulling it to the rear of the vehicle so that it looked as if it had been formed, as if the tank had run over it and wiped it with the hole. At the same time I also got the suspension elements dirty. Later after putting the wheels on I will improve their appearance. Then I put the product on the fenders and in the nooks and crannies where it could accumulate while driving. I have to admit that it gave a nice effect and the shape is very close to the real mud we can see on the vehicles. How we impose them depends entirely on our imagination, but the most important thing is to be moderate. For a moment I focused on the front bottom edge where I decided to apply more as if the tank had burst its nose. A bit of speckling won't hurt either. I realized that in real vehicles these surfaces are almost entirely covered with mud but on the model you need to find a balance because it's not worth covering the entire surface with a uniform layer of mud. It will look bad. I made this mistake in the past and now I know that what you see here will look much better when finished. I decided to put some more dry pigments on the front plate. I soaked them in white spirit and dried them quickly. Taking advantage of the fact that I had open boxes with pigments, I started to dirty the road wheels. The principle was exactly the same as on the hull. The whole thing was to be used as a base for dark mud. As a result, irregular discoloration was created and of course, everything was preserved with white spirit and then dried with a hair dryer. <laughs> Thank you. 
I use a few drops of the thinner and pigment to make a mixture and then speckling on the wheels. The splashes are very random and therefore look natural. Of course I did it with both colors the same as before on the hull. The upper parts of the model were also covered with small splashes of mud. Their excess can be easily removed with a brush soaked in a thinner. Here I use both colors as before. Well, it's time for the dark mat on the wheels. As you can see I put them mainly on the edges, the same like the couple minutes ago. Paying attention to their position in the row I compacted the mat properly. The internal ones had smoother mat and the external ones rough. This is also a very important element in the visual perception of the model because it introduced more naturalism to the final result. It may sound funny, but it is. You will judge for yourself in a moment. Also the rubber rims were colored but more like a dry brush so as not to create unnecessary texture because it's known that in these places the mud wouldn't collect. The rims should be more flat. Even more speckling but now with proper dark mud diluted with the tap water. The rear of the vehicle also cannot be forgotten or overlooked. There should also be splashes of mud in all colors that were applied earlier. And we have ready sets of wheels prepared in the right order to be put on. I decided not to change the settings that were earlier at the construction stage. It looks good so it stays as it is. You can start putting the whole thing together. It took a little effort to put the wheels on the axles because some of them resisted. It always happens when we don't mask them before painting and just another layer thickens each of them. I always forget about it. The big advantage of using ready-made AK mat is that it's hard when dry and doesn't crumble. Thanks to this we can confidently touch it and it won't change its shape. After setting all the wheels in the right position you can start adding mud on the clean sections to make it look realistic. And now a little bit of moisture. The same wet effect product was slightly diluted and slowly piece by piece applied to the dark mud. On the hull, on the sides and on the wheels. Thanks to the thinner it was more satin than glossy after drying but that's exactly what I wanted to achieve. In my opinion this is very realistic. At the same time very easy to get. It's best to do it with an old brush with damaged bristles because it makes the stains irregular. The previously made mud on the idler and drive wheels was also painted with glossy varnish. All in all, the photos often show such clogged wheels regardless of the period. World War II or modern vehicles, pfft, mud always behaves the same. Ok, wheels made, so now it's time for the tracks. I decided to fasten them before putting on the model. This is more convenient and faster than manipulating the entire model and figuring out how to pin a pin to the track. First I put on the drive wheel so that the teeth fit well into the holes. Then I applied some slow drying thick glue to have time to properly align the pin to the drive wheel and then the same to the idler.
And now I could put the trucks on. You have to play with it a bit, but it goes quite fast. Then the appropriate tensioning with the idler and the element is ready. But that's not the end of our muddy game. Now we will put the mud on the upper parts of the model. I was inspired by my friend Lester Plaskett and his Sherman. As for me it looks very realistic and it's definitely a brave step when it comes to dirting the model. I realize that not everyone can be a fan of such strong weathering, but I like such mega realistic effects on the models. I use the toothpick to add small amounts of the product and slowly build its structure. It's supposed to simulate the ground which fell on the vehicle during the fight after explosions around the tank, as well as while the crew members were moving on it and while driving on difficult terrain. It's time to make some finishing touches on the Tiger project, so let's get to work. Let's start with this little roof that I mentioned earlier. A simple idea, but you can do some effects on it. First, a little silver flash on the fresh lines of the wells. There aren't many of them, but they contrast nicely with the dark color of the plate and chips. Secondly, a bit of rust around the wells, and thirdly, streaks, of course, rusty. All in really small amounts to make it look subtle, but without a doubt what's going on. Ok, when I had a pencil next to me I polished the machine guns. The one in the turret and the one in the hull. You can also do it with pigments or even with paint, but why complicate your life? The most important thing is to do it gently so as not to damage the paint coating, which despite the undercoat may unexpectedly be rubbed off if you do it too hard. And now our old friends from previous episodes. Three rust colors that we will use on towing cables and other elements. All the colors are randomly applied to the ropes and to the thin truck service rope. We don't cover the whole thing, only some fragments. In some places you can also put two or even three colors in one place so it will be more varied. This is fast work and you can get all the robes on the model in 5 minutes. The main thing is not to be afraid of using the products. When the paints dry it's worth rubbing them with a pencil as well as smashing guns. A little trick. Try to draw a weave lengthwise as it will be more effective than crosswise. Look how I do it. And the cables are painted. Now as suggested by several of my subscribers, I'm tweaking the base camo S minion launchers. Thanks gentlemen for pointing this out to me. Easy peasy. Back to the rust. A bit of shade on the shower will do well for its final look. Of course with the use of my favorite tool which is a hair dryer. Now a bit of pencil polishing and the shovel is ready. To apply the polisher I also use a silicone rubber which also works well in such tasks. A continuation of polishing but this time on the antenna which in a moment will be mounted in the socket on the hole. In my opinion such a metal one looks much better than a plastic rod. Its shape is better made which cannot be said about plastic. Now the figure. I know some of you would love to see me painting figures but I'm not a master in this matter. I plan to do it in a while to show how I paint come on Wolf and SS uniforms but for now have a look at how I upgrade the Evolution Miniatures one. As you can see I used Archer stickers which are perfect for detailing. If you don't know this product, check the link in the description. 
Of course I treated all the stickers with decal softener from Microscale. In general I was wondering how and whether to use this figure at all, but I decided that it would be fun to liven up the scene with the tank. I had doubts because nowhere did I find a photo from the action where you can see the crew in such a position in a tiger. However, despite this I decided that it looks great and even if it isn't true to reality, it will look like that on my model. If anyone can confirm or deny it, please comment and explain how it functioned in these tanks. The second issue is the size of the shell. Originally this figure ejects the shell from the 75mm Panther gun. However, when I compared the size to the Eureka XXL product I was about to use, it surprised me that they were almost identical. Who missed measure or overscaled the miniature? I bet that the figure is a bit too big, but it isn't a problem because everything fit perfectly and you can't see such big differences. In 35 scale the difference between the 75 and 88 mm is small. In this particular case I don't care about it because more important was to prepare interesting look than 1 mm of difference. Ok, the end of this topic. The pigmentation was obviously done with the same pigments I used previously. I dirtied the model with parts to keep it in order and not to forget about any element. I applied pigments alternately around the turret ring into nooks and crannies in random locations on horizontal surfaces. Of course they were merged with the surface with fixer, in this case it was white spirit because it dries quickly and leaves no traces. Obviously a hair dryer was necessary. You already know this favorite tool of mine. Maybe I will call it accelerator or something like this. What do you think? Please let me know in the comments. Of course there are also dusty effects on the sides of the hull to keep everything in a meaningful unity. I decided that there would be some lumps of mud on the engine plate accidentally thrown as if the tank had been showered after an explosion nearby. I think it's obvious that it's completely natural on the battlefield. I scrapped off dried pieces of ready-made mud from the lid and crushed them, even cut them and then sprinkled like a salt on the model. A bit of corrections, changing the place here and there and then soak them with plastic cement from Modeler's World. I like the effect very much and it looks very realistic. I took the pigments again to put on the model but now I focused on dirting the turret. By the same method as before I did some effects and preserved them with white spirit.
And now a general look at the model from a distance. As you can see the camo colors have become much muffled and it now looks very natural, just like on vehicles serving in the field. In contrast for example I didn't specifically cover the hatches which made them more visible. An old trick but very effective. Time for superb effects in the form of stains from different liquids and water. First grease stains of oil around the turret ring. There is no need to limit yourself as they will be mostly covered anyway but it's worth that some irregular spots extend beyond the outline of the turret. Of course they mustn't be missing on the engine plate. Here the lumps of mud make a lot of mess so small spots won't change much but in my opinion there is no point in letting go. The second effect is dirty water. Imagine the crew spilling water on the dusty surfaces of the vehicle. This is exactly how it should be presented. Maybe even more but I didn't want to overdo it. Better less than more. You can of course add small drops by speckling, it all depends on our needs and imagination. Some streaks on the sides and it looks great. Now some oil paints to make heavy oil leaks on the wheels. I diluted both colors and applied to make appropriate stains. Nothing difficult although they look best on less muddy wheels. The great moment has come to finally place the model on almost ready stand, but based on my experience I decided to do it with a long screw. Mud alone won't keep the model securely. I drilled a hole in the floor so that the screw wasn't too loose in it. I set the model on the base trying to insert the tracks as accurately as possible into the previously imprinted tracks and I put the screw in. By the way, if you haven't seen the movie about the stand, click on the banner at the top. The model is holding up perfectly, but there was a moment of uncertainty. Now I put the mud back on to push the tank more into the ground. I repeated the whole procedure for making the stand as you can see in the previous episode. It took me about 20 minutes. Thanks to this the model fitted well with the ground and everything looked very natural.
A bit of glossy warnish to make it wet and we can move to the next stage. In the meantime I fitted the figure into the hatch and glued the hatch cover permanently. Helmut looks great. Congratulations Evolution Miniatures, the figure is really nice. It gives the whole scene so much life that nothing else is needed. I started matching the Eureka XXL shells to the base. As you can see the story is told in a simple way. The tiger stands on a fire position and conducts rapid fire at the advancing enemy. The loader ejects the shells from the tank and we can only guess how many hits the crew has already scored. Each shell was placed on a wooden stick and first cleaned with a model degreaser and then covered with a metal primer. When they dry up I applied acrylic brass color into two layers and glued each to its place. Now a little wash and we have the elements ready. When I opened the bag with chains I laughed to myself because I realized that almost every model has even a small piece on it. But the tank without the chain? This cannot be. Here I put this piece on pipes from the Fifal Air system and glue it with pigment cement from Modeler's World. It worked great, it dries quickly, smells good, leaves no traces after drying and holds tight. Advantages only. Highly recommended. The heated wire from the set of rear model trucks was easier to bend. After correct shaping I glued it to the bucket and painted. Then I made potatoes from the mustard seeds, adding them into a bucket and pouring glue over them. After drying it was enough to paint over with brown paints and add some earth pigment. Simple and effective. I also prepared the seeds in a sweeter version, apples left by the commander. They were painted with shades of red with a slight satin shimmer to look like fruits. A good place to hang a bucket is also an important matter because I don't think the crew would want to lose such a valuable cargo. This is why I always smile when a bucket is hanging just above the ground on a towing guy. Quick installation of the antenna rod, unification with pigments and we already have radio communication. A bit of mud on the bottom of the bucket which is heavily treated with pigments anyway, but you still have to merge it to make sense and look realistic. And this is the effect when the pigment cement is dry. I know, now thunders will come down on me for this salt. I know, I know, I know, but it looks cool. A little won't hurt and so I did it. That's all.
Little pieces of double side tape were added to the ring so the turret wouldn't be too loose. They did their job perfectly. They hold the entire element but if necessary you can safely remove the turret from the model. Now some little rack to throw on the vehicle, a piece of tissue soaked in glue. Just place it on the model and let it dry. Then a bit of wash and we have a ready-made rack forgotten by the crew and lying quietly somewhere between the elements of the equipment. A larger tarp is a greater challenge. As I have previously colored pieces of tissues, now it was enough to just soak it in glue and place it properly on the model. A few drops is enough. Drain off the excess and put it on the model. It seems simple because it is. Of course a bit of weathering afterwards is necessary. The most important thing is to put it in a realistic way. I always try to imagine how such a tarp could look like thrown or squeezed between the elements of the vehicle. Pay attention to faults and proper fit to the armor. Now you can see how fast I make the weather ring, which is made mostly with the pigments. Yeah, I know the movie is sped up, but it doesn't take much time anyway. As German vehicles very often carried flags for air identification, I decided to prepare for my Tiger 1 as well. As you can see I use a piece of tissue again, which is painted with acrylic paints. The most attention should be paid to painting the Hakenkreuz, although I didn't care about it because I knew that it would be folded so... So, therefore in order to avoid unnecessary problems this fragment will be cut from the movie. You know, it's just a model but there is always someone who doesn't like it and I don't want to lose my legacy this way. So the flag is painted and after drying the paint I soaked it gently with glue and placed it on the model. Any imperfections in the painting will be corrected after drying. To speed up the drying I used my accelerator. I added a flexible string to do a flag binding. Thanks to this it looks protected against the gusts of wind. When the paper was dry I started to correct the base colors, this is red and white, as well as to make shadows and highlights. Finally I decided to add some extra extras in the form of hand grenades from Eureka XXL. 
The metal parts are great and they do the job when painted. A handy kit for defense against enemy infantry. I was wondering whatever to add some PPS or MP40, but I gave it up. A little bit of dirt at the end with the pigments and it's ready. Yeah, another project is ready. It took a while to prepare it, but I hope that the films from the How to Paint series have been useful to some and have helped in building and painting of the models. As for me, it was another interesting lesson from working on the model, I used new products, worked even more on movies and gained new experiences. Thanks to everyone who is with me all the time by subscribing to my channel, writing the comments and clicking likes on my videos. I am very happy with the positive feedback. Thanks to you this channel exists and grows every day. I hope it will do even better. Thank you very much my friends. For now please take a look at the effect of my work, subscribe to the channel, comment and like, visit my Instagram and blog. Thanks for watching, that's all for today. Take care, build models and see you next time. Cheers!